Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to the sponsored talk by the K Keck Institute of Space Science. Uh, sorry for stumbling over that. Um, it is my extreme pleasure to um, do the introduction for Dr. Amanda Stockton, who's an associate professor of chemistry and biochemistry and bioengineering, it appears, at Georgia Tech. Uh, I told Amanda I would not embarrass her, but I lied. <laughs> so um, I will do the professional part first and then tell you an embarrassing story, so you will pay attention. Uh, Amanda got two bachelor's degrees from MIT in chemistry and aerospace engineering, followed by a master's at Brown in chemistry, and a PhD in chemistry at the University of California at Berkeley. So she's definitely smarter than me. Uh, Amanda and I actually met in Iceland um, when she started the Feldspar project, and I was just a postdoc. And um, I remember uh, being there and seeing her and thinking, gosh, when I grow up, I hope I can be that good. And not expecting at that point that we would end up best friends and that she would be the only person who managed to make it into my pandemic bubble and stay at my house uh, during the pandemic. So for the zombie apocalypse, it'll be Amanda and I ride or die. Um, so curly hair mafia for the win. Um, but yes, Amanda, would you love to come up here and tell everyone about Feldspar and why it is I'm so impressed with you. Thank you, Charity, for that wonderful introduction. And I don't know what was embarrassing about that, but I do know that you have stories that are significantly <laughs> more embarrassing than that one. Uh, so thank you guys so much for, for coming here and giving me the opportunity to present some of the, uh, the wonderful work that my students have done. Um, I, uh, I'm really excited to talk about Feldspar. It's one of um, my group's favorite projects. And um, I kind of like to give a little bit of introduction to what we do. I don't think that the outreach slide that I like to put in at the start of my talk is 100% necessary for this audience, but it is now habit and I like it anyway. So the question is, what is astrobiology? Uh, typically somebody in the audience will look at this and etymologically pull apart this word and say it is space biology, in which case I'm like, so uh, Martians and then, oh wow, that switched very suddenly. Um, but because uh, I usually like to have these come in one at a time. But science fiction has done a really great job of giving us uh, lots of examples for how to think about uh, extraterrestrial life, and that's kind of helped guide some of our technological developments as well when we talk about trying to develop uh, warp technology or transporters or uh, the tricorder. Uh, but still, at this point, we have not actually detected um, extraterrestrial life, and so I, I kind of liked um, these questions that were um, formulated a, a while back, but it's basically questions that humans have been asking since we became human. Are we alone in the universe? How does life begin and evolve? What's the future of life here on Earth and beyond? And so my group tries to tackle uh, a lot of these questions. And so um, at the core of all of this is uh, microfluidics, but today, I do not have time to talk about all of that, so we'll just look at um, a vignette from what are the limits of life on Earth. Um, today we'll talk about feldspar, but we've also got uh, work with the uh, oceans across space and time where we're looking at hypersaline lakes. Um, and uh, we've been interested in underwater exploration with the uh, capability to count and sort cells and um, also with in-situ culturing techniques uh, where you can isolate individual organisms, try to grow them up enough that you could uh, actually come over, overcome the, the, the weed issue of um, you end up growing the organisms that uh, grow best in the lab rather than what's out there. Um, for today, we'll talk about feldspar. And whenever I am giving this to a quite general audience, I will ask, where should we look for life? and let you guys tell me. So where should we go? <laughs> so so the, the Earth question here I, I particularly like because don't you stop looking for something once you've found it? <laughs> um, but uh, 
we've done a lot of looking this last uh, few days at some icy moons and, of course, Mars. And Feldspar really is looking at um, kind of the, the Martian question. And then I want to take some lessons that we learned from uh, our field sites and think about what does that then mean if we're trying to think about going to another, um, another type of environment. And this was really motivated by uh, Mars sample return, where we've got this question of what samples should we collect and bring back to Earth whenever we have such a limited number of samples. Um, and this is an older animation, um, but the, the questions kind of remain the same. How do you select whether you're going to sample on this side of the hill, the other side of the hill, uh, down here in the basement? Are we uh, collecting from here? Or over here, how are, we collect, how are we selecting those samples? And so that was what drove our look at um, some of these field sites. And we wanted to have uh, some degree of fidelity. While you can't have perfect fidelity in any analog mission uh, to all aspects, we wanted to have uh, a couple of key three areas. And so one of those I've already mentioned, how do you select that sample? And we were thinking about this on multiple scales, from how do you pick where you're going to land? Once you land, how do you pick where you're going to drive to? Once you get there, you know, you've got an option of this sample or over there. And then once you get in even closer, you know, You've got centimeter scale resolution for LIBS. You've got even smaller resolution than that for uh, sample selection. And then uh, we wanted to have some degree of fidelity to the uh, geochemical measurements that would be available on a Mars rover. And then we wanted to also wonder, how do you fully characterize the habitability of a sample here on Earth? We argue that the best way to understand habitability is to see whether an environment is inhabited, because terrestrial biota is um, so uh, predominant. And, and with that, then, we can look at ATP and uh, DNA, which are very highly conserved um, across all organisms. But I just want to make a note. I'm not saying that we should look for these very highly evolved molecules only uh, whenever we're going to extraterrestrial locations. I'm simply saying that they work really well for us to identify biology here on Earth. And then uh, I have kind of mentioned this as well, but what we're really kind of getting interested in is uh, what types of scales are we thinking about when we sample? Uh, and if you have an otherwise um, what looks to be uh, a very, I'm going to say homogeneous environment, and I'll try to um, parameterize that a little bit better. Uh, but does it matter where you collect samples from? How many samples do you need to collect in order to recognize, uh, to fully represent that, um, that sampling area? And then also kind of what are some of these uh, gradients that we can try to pull out of some of the, these locations uh, for that? And so uh, kind of tried to indicate then that we've got these different scales that we can look at. And in order to, uh, to try to piece together what scales are we thinking about whenever we want to do sampling for life detection, uh, we also needed um, some field sites to deploy them on. So I've got a map of Iceland here. And there's a couple of excellent locations here. We were inspired originally to go to Fimborahas, which was associated with the Eyjafjallajökull eruption in 2011 that famously shut down European space travel, um, air travel, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> it'd be nice if we had space travel. Uh, um, and uh, close to that, there's Mylafetla Sonda, which is um, a recently deglaciated plane. Uh, these were to us a reasonable analog for what we were trying to uh, tackle because very, very low biomass um, with terrestrial biology being uh, relatively sterilized from the catastrophic event of resurfacing from a, a volcanic eruption. Um, that's kind of what we're looking for. We're looking to see how does biology respond to these niches, not to the niche that's created from macrofauna uh, around it. And then um, once we had been uh, looking at Fimborahals for a number of years, uh, fortunately, we got another eruption. Iceland tends to have an eruption around the, the four-year cycle, which is wonderful when that's also about the lifetime of a standard award to explore these locations. Uh, we got a new one, Holochron, up in uh, the highlands. And it's uh, a really wonderful location because it is 
very far away from any anthropogenic con contamination, uh, where Fembotnahals is on a, a, um, a very popular hiking route. Uh, also, the Icelandic government has pretty much firewalled this off. You're not allowed up on that volcano unless you have a scientific permit. Not even the rangers of the uh, national park are allowed out there unless they're escorting a scientific team. And then next to that, we've got Dinyasandr, which is an alluvial plain uh, kept barren of macrofauna from um, regular aeolian action. So up close, this is Holothurn, my new favorite volcano. Uh, Dinyasandr, next to that, you can see the, uh, the aeolian action. And then down south, we've got Fembotohals and Mylofetlasandr. So um, I'm going to stick to just telling stories uh, of these two. Um, Fembotohals and Mylofetlasandr are a bit older of sites. Uh, the last time we were out on Fembotohals, we actually saw a lichen. And once you get to uh, the complexity of a multicellular organism like a lichen, that's when my group taps out. Um, so we'll, we'll stick to uh, these sites. And Dinyasandr is really excellent for understanding how many samples and at what spacing do we need to sample in order to, uh, to really represent an area. So we'll start there. And there would not be a field site type of talk without some epic photos. Uh, so um, to get to Dinyasandr, which is over very close to, uh, to Holochrun, we have to load up uh, the truck, drive across multiple rivers, um, hike for a significant distance, and then we uh, fly our quadcopter up so that we can get aerial imagery. And that helps us um, identify where we are going to sample. Um, and what we want to do is collect samples across multiple spatial scales. And so uh, collect samples at the corners of a 100 meter triangle. Uh, three samples is kind of the bare minimum to be able to do any sort of statistical test. Um, and we're trying to get enough samples that we can do some statistics, but not oversample to the point where we can never get the data out. Uh, so 100 meters, and then at each one of those corners, um, we collect again at uh, 10 meter spacing at each of those corners, one meter spacing at each of those corners, 10 centimeter spacing, and we have done the test where we go to one centimeter spacing at that point. And below one centimeter spacing, we're really not able to collect enough sample to be able to subsample and do all the different types of analyses that we want to do. So that is kind of the minimum. Uh, and we do a number of different analyses on these samples. Um, so we have some in-field analytical tools where this is uh, Elena Amador. Uh, who is holding the uh, near-infrared reflectance uh, spectrometer and ASD spectrometer. And then we've got Erica Rader, who is uh, doing X-ray fluorescence. And so this is able to give us a uh, mineralogy type of information, kind of uh, similar information to what you would, might get out of um, a, a Raman instrument, but you're obtaining it a different way. And the X-ray fluorescence gives you elemental composition, kind of like what you would get out of a Libs instrument, again, obtaining it a different way. And our argument here then is that uh, this Dinyasandr sand uh, is, is relatively the same across a very large area uh, of this, this site. And you might just look at this sand and be like, I see silver and I see dark. It's clearly, you know, sorted, but uh, the, the coloration really just comes from uh, the, the amount of hydration. We do get um, rain events, and so the, the wetter stuff is darker. It's, that's uh, the albedo there. So one of the first things we do after we've got our infield data is we take these back to the lab so that we can do some biological uh, assays. And we do ATP analysis um, within 24 hours of sample collection because uh, this molecule does degrade relatively quickly under standard conditions, and it can give us an idea of what is the, met metabol um, the metabolic activity of our samples. And we do this with a very simple uh, bioluminescence assay where uh, <laughs> if you react luciferin um, with ATP in the presence of oxygen and some magnesium, uh, you get an enzymatic reaction that generates oxyluciferin in the uh, excited state. And when that decays to the ground state, it emits a photon. We count photons, so we count the number of molecules of ATP, assuming everything else is in excess. And we set this up sometimes in hotels, but we have uh, 
fortunately managed to um, establish some really nice collaborations at the University of Akiberi. So you can see we have an actual lab space uh, to work in uh, with whenever we're working out of Holokrun. Uh, we work at the uh, Golskoli uh, Junior High School whenever we're uh, down in the south of, of Iceland. Okay, so let's just go back to what we're thinking here because I'm gonna show you some ATP data. Uh, so we've got samples at 100 meters and then at 10 meters and then at one meter and then at 10 centimeter spacing and then we also repeat this at kilometer scales. So I've color coded the data where at 100 meter spacing we're gonna have red, blue, and green. And at the apex of one meter triangles, we'll have different shades. So red, maroon, light red, I, I think that's called pink. Um, and at each one of these corners, we'll have three samples, again, at 10 centimeter spacing. So you'll see three of this color, three of this color, three of this color. That will repeat for 10 meter spacing, and then we'll switch colors for 100 meter spacing. Um, and then we'll have that repeated three times for uh, the three different kilometer spacings, okay? So that means then that these three are 10 centimeters apart. We go over ten, uh, one meter, and those three are 10 centimeters apart, go over one meter, then go over 10 meters, and that pattern repeats itself, and then go 100 meters over and 100 meters over, and then uh, a kilometer and a kilometer over. And one of the things that we can kind of uh, see here is these error bars. This is probably uh, not the, the best way to represent this data, and I'll, I'll switch to box and whisker plots in the next one, because this is actually uh, based on the average and the standard deviation of three subsamples. So this is representing how heterogeneous that um, sample that was collected in that Falcon tube at 50 mils, uh, whenever we aliquot that out into small um, 50 milligram uh, sample sets. And so what we can already see is that there's a lot of heterogeneity um, in some of our sites, like Dinius Andres site two, which is one kilometer away from Dinius Andres site three. And then another thing that we can see is, um, while I'm not showing any uh, statistical tests here. Um, these error bars don't really overlap with those error bars, so uh, uh, that 10 meter uh, spacing means that uh, those samples are, are almost certainly different from each other, but we're also starting to be able to pick apart maybe that's going on at the 10 centimeter scale as well. So that may mean then, if we want to find that hot spot, where is this sample rather than this sample, we may need to think about collecting samples at 10 centimeter spacing. Um, but then again, you've got a lot of variability here. The overall average here is higher than at this site, so maybe you also need that kilometer level spacing. So um, let's think about some other things that we can do in order to try to pull this apart. Uh, one of the things that we did, once we got them back to Georgia Tech on our full sample return type of analog operationally, uh, we extracted DNA and um, quantified that just using a simple qubit fluorescence assay. Uh, and these samples are grouped by one meter uh, separation, so these samples are all one meter from these samples are all one meter from these samples. Uh, the line indicates an average and then the, the different data points. So this is the average across uh, Dinya Sonder site one and site two. Um, and, and we can see then that that um, statistically significant differences between uh, samples that are as close as one meter uh, continues to hold true over in DNA content uh, as well. If we were to then group these by 10 meter separation, uh, we'd start to see uh, similar things there as well. And so um, let me just kind of walk through some of the rest of the data that we collected, and then we can start to think about what are some correlations that we could do? How could we understand uh, without having to take the sample back to the lab, go through the whole process of doing a DNA extraction and fluorescence quantitation. Uh, how would we know that we should select one of these samples rather than one of these samples? Uh, okay, so we get DNA content, that's just bulk DNA content that we can extract. We also get um, the number of bacterial DNA content uh, uh, copies. Um, using quantitative uh, PCR. And again, 
get this grouped in whatever way that we want. We're taking this for each one of the samples at 10 centimeter separation. So how we display it is really just, are we trying to understand uh, what levels we've got in, in what type of spacing? Uh, we also get moisture content. Uh, moisture content does have a lot of uh, variability based on when you're sampling versus the last rain event. That's a known, um, that's a known uh, aspect to this work, but uh, moisture content is something that you can relatively easily pick out um, spectroscopically, although we do it uh, gravimetrically. Okay. So if we were to kind of plot the different types of data next to each other, we've got uh, the double-stranded DNA content, 16S uh, content, uh, number of copies, and the moisture content. Um, but then we're also collecting uh, additional things that we could pick out from, um, from photography and things like the grain size. And so here, um, what we've done after we've done the, uh, the gravimetric moisture content, it's everybody's first week on the, the job in my group is watching dirt dry. The next job is to take it over to the, uh, the sieving station and uh, separate into different components. So we're seeing a lot more of this very small fraction, less than uh, 425 uh, micron uh, grain sizes. Then we are seeing the larger sizes. Um, Dini Sonder is a lot of small grains, but at the end of the day, We've got a lot of different types of data that we can plug into our um, correlation matrices here. And so let me, I thought that I had animated this, so I'm sorry for just overwhelming you with a wall of data. Patience as we walk through it. Um, so what is being shown here is the number of samples that when you do a pairwise comparison between the two sample sets. So if they're separated by one meter, we're gonna compare those and we're going to see are those samples statistically significantly different from each other or are they statistically similar to each other? And then we're going to take the number of comparisons that are different and divide it by the total number of comparisons one would make and that's this percentage here. And so if we were to separate our samples by one meter and do that statistical test. Uh, at one meter in this site, um, a majority of these samples are statistically similar. That's why we're seeing low numbers here. But if we were to go out to the, the 10 meter regime, that's when our samples are becoming a lot more statistically dissimilar. And so by doing these tests, we can see that that first impulse to say we needed to select samples every 10 centimeters to represent that area, that may not actually be the case. Statistically, it's looking like uh, you want to go to 10 meter separation in order to, uh, to pick out that heterogeneity if you wanted to represent that heterogeneity in your sample. And then um, how would you know what to pick? We've done some, uh, some Pearson's correlation coefficients. If it is blue and big, it is a strong correlation in the positive area. So if DNA content goes up, the number of 16S co uh, copies goes up. That makes sense. We would hope that to be true. Um, as the um, DNA content goes up, our sediment, uh, our smaller sediment sizes are also uh, going down a little bit. And so these are some things that uh, we can start to put together in order to try to figure out where to sample. And uh, we'll come back to some more uh, correlation plots um, in, in the future. So <clears throat> at this point, um, we've kind of said that 10 meter separation is um, the best, although if we can get down to more uh, replicates, that would be even better. OK. Also wouldn't be a field talk if we didn't talk about some sort of, uh, of transect. So for this, we need to go out to Holokrun. And holocrine is a lot of fun because there is a glacial flood in the afternoon that cuts off your ability to uh, safely exit the volcano. Um, and so that means we have to wake up very, very early. And this is at four in the morning. That's why uh, Dr. George Tan here looks quite grumpy. Um, <laughs> however, it is also summer, so it is bright daylight uh, whenever you are out there. Um, and you can park relatively 
close actually with the truck. It's maybe an hour and a half hike out to the volcano. And then um, we, we can collect our samples there. And then of course uh, we have to drive out before the flood gets so bad that we will get stuck. Um, and, and we've done a lot of things there as well where we've got our um, near infrared, we've got our XRF, um, we collect our samples and uh, I just like to make fun of poor Dr. Alex Zessa here um, who are staring off into space while the rest of us are doing work, but there's really nothing for him to do right at that moment, so uh, that was fine. What we did is we found this gradient uh, along the way where we're going from this um, darker basalt sand, very similar to Dingusander, into a more um, pumice and ashy area with a lighter color of material. Uh, and we're numbering these from darker to lighter in order. And if we were to look at these up close, we can see there's some very uh, distinct differences in grain size, where we go from um, a more Dina Saunders style of, of grain to uh, a more, uh, actually quite fine ash sediment to larger uh, pumicey rocks. And Erica Rader made these slides for us. I really liked her graphic, uh, graphical uh, style, so I'm going to just use them and try to walk through what's going on here. So this is that very fine grained uh, ash, the larger pumice, uh, and the, the, the small basalt sand. And right at that sample is where we're getting uh, basically chlorine loss, and you can tell that by the elemental uh, compositions. Now these are not, um, these are the weight percent of this element if it were all as this oxide. We're, it's not necessarily tied up in that explicit oxide. Um, if we were to go to grain size, uh, we're going from about 80% of the smaller fraction up to um, a significant amount of the, the larger um, grains. And so uh, Erica would label this as the aquitard uh, bump associated with that. We've also got uh, the different band that depths that correlate with uh, moisture content. And so we can see that this is where most of the water is getting uh, held. And then with DNA and ATP, um, we're seeing that we get more of our terrestrial biomarkers as the grain size actually gets larger, which doesn't necessarily uh, line up well with what we saw at Dinu Sonder itself, despite the fact that these are quite close to each other. Uh, so if we put all the, the data together the way that we might be used to, uh, to seeing it plotted, this is what we'd be looking at with DNA content going up as we uh, go up to the more pumicey areas, bacterial copies going up as we go to the more pumicey areas, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we were able to do a lot of other things as well. We did XRD, uh, all of our grain size measurements, uh, et cetera. And we also got to do some sequencing on these samples. And so um, the gamma proteobacteria are pretty high on either side of our um, fine-grained ash. Uh, and if we were to try to plot out any sort of uh, ability to do some statistical analyses of these, we might be looking at some plots like this, where as we go from this older pyroclastic terrain to the younger, uh, more Plinian terrain, we're seeing a, a decrease in um, the, the number of clades of uh, methanotrophs and methylotrophs. Uh, we're also seeing a decrease in um, methanogen species. Uh, and, and we can really start to see that the microbial community is, is impacted across these gradients. And um, one thing I didn't mention is from our past work that I had shown, we do need to, to take samples every uh, 10 centimeters or one meter. And so uh, this transect was replicated at those scales across, um, rather than just saying we can take one sample along this transect and, and represent the area. We do need to repeat those transects multiple times. Okay, so correlations. This is where it gets fun. Uh, again, big and red. Uh, strong correlation 
negative, which means uh, if you've got lots of calcium in your sample, you don't have very much silicon in your sample. Um, big and blue, good for each other. So if you have lots of iron in your sample, you're also going to have lots of ATP in your sample. And so what we found is that ATP was strongly correlated positively with sodium, iron, um, and phosphorus, and also with moisture. Uh, that could make some sense. Uh, and then with DNA, we were also seeing um, similar correlations to what we saw with ATP, which um, would fall out naturally because DNA and ATP are positively correlated. And then with grain size, higher than two millimeter grain sizes is, is good. The smaller grain sizes are bad. That doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense if you're used to gardening. Gravel is not really where you want to grow your plants. But we are in this wind sucked regime where the larger rock sizes aren't getting mechanically moved as often. So this just may be a more stable uh, habitat in this regime. So I thought I would then pull up our sequencing data from dinghy sonder itself. So if we look back here, gamma proteal bacteria is kind of our, our more dominant organism in this transect with the darker material being uh, very similar to dinghy sonder. We get to dinghy sonder and that changes. Actinobacteria are our more dominant uh, species. Even though these sites are, are relatively um, close in proximity, very similar mineralogically, and some of the correlations that you would want to see have also changed. And so that means for each unique environment, you're going to have to come back in and do a similar feldspar style uh, study to see how close you need to collect samples and what your correlations would need to be. Um, so uh, we're putting together uh, a lot of this information and trying to really nail down some lessons that we can translate from one environment to another. Um, there's two excellent theses on this that we are attempting to get uh, actually published, but once a student has a real job, not in your group anymore, sometimes the writing processes slow down. So we're struggling through that together. Uh, I thought I'd take us back to the, the Dinya Saunders site and the ATP data that I showed earlier, um, where we have this high level of heterogeneity uh, in our uh, site two, away from site one and uh, site three. And what's causing that heterogeneity? We were um, trying to figure out what was going on there. And from our aerial imagery, um, there's nothing that's super unique about Dini Sonder Site 2, but once we get to more like a, a mass cam analog of Erica walking around with a, a nice camera, uh, we can see that there's uh, a lot more of these uh, medium-sized rocks that are providing a little bit more um, stable microclimates uh, in these areas. And once we come back in and start to do some um, visual processing on where these samples were with respect to those rocks, we start to see that that's where we can start to see some of these correlations with uh, the, the higher levels of ATP that's also correlated with higher levels of DNA. Um, and that then means we've got a whole lot of different uh, things that we can do with this data. Uh, we can start to put together um, principal component analyses. We can do uh, unguided selection to see how many samples you would have to randomly select in order to uh, get something at the average or above. Um, and, and that's work that, that's ongoing that uh, I just didn't think that we would have time for uh, today. So if we zoom back out then to Holocron, this is our, uh, our rift in, the, in the, the, the sand there. And we've been getting data now since 2016 for Holochrone, and we have, or 2016 to 2019 for Holochrone. We've got 2016 to 2019 for Dinyasander, and we've got 2013 to 
I think our last year for Finn Hals was 2019 as well. So now we've also got these time course data and we can start to see how does um, primary secession work in one of these volcanic areas far away from any uh, macrofauna that can blow organisms in. Um, how does this uh, material weather over time with exposure to water and wind, but very low terrestrial biology. Um, it's a very unique environment where we could also get some lessons that might apply to human uh, space travel, where we might want to take a uh, basaltic terrain and turn it into farmland to grow, uh, grow items for us. And at the end of the day, what we're really trying to get to is if we were a rover on Iceland or on Mars, where would we want to wander to in order to select our samples? And we're learning that that challenge is not as straightforward as uh, perhaps one would hope, but that it is most likely a solvable challenge. So I'll show you our team. Uh, this one was, let's see, Zach and Scott are there, so it must be 2017. Um, but the, the team changes. We've got a lot of um, collaborators here, both in the US and international. And in 2018, we were lucky enough to be joined by uh, videographer uh, Mike Toyan, who followed us around with a really cool quadcopter and uh, took some good footage. And if you ever want to have your team look really cool and hardcore, invite Mike to come along with you. So this is just the, the quick trailer for, uh, for the film that he made. Come on. Oh no, there it goes. <laughs> um, he also made this uh, over dramatic. Iceland, a harsh Nordic landscape where fire Version. meets ice. A country of volcanoes, glaciers, waterfalls, and expansive tundra. And for some, the perfect analog environment for informing NASA's search for life on Mars. I'm driving! I'm driving too. So that was my shameless plug to check out Mike's excellent work. It was it was really nice to have him out. It was it's always fun to share your science with somebody that's not as uh, hooked into it as as you guys kind of tend to have to be in order to get through it uh, in a reasonable time frame. So let me see if I can move on. Do 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 do. <laughs> um, and, and so before I, I close out of here, um, as a professor at Georgia Tech, I have a lot of students come through my group, and if, if a student applies to your lab, I want you to have some context for uh, the fact that they're probably not all coming out of this type of work that I just showed. We do a lot of different things, and so uh, I showed a couple of projects that we had inside of uh, what are the limits of life on Earth, We've also got things tackling these questions of is there life beyond Earth, where we're developing impact penetrator probes. Uh, we were still working with uh, capillary electrophoresis for soft landers or flyby, flyby instrument suites with um, uh, UC Berkeley, and um, have been interested in what happens to ice grains after they've been captured uh, in a uh, Enceladus plume flyby type of a, a mission, what happens to those organic chemicals, and can we uh, figure out what was in them prior to their impacting, and for that we've been looking at this um, laser-induced um, projectile impact, I don't remember what LIPID stands for right now, I'm drawing a blank, but you, you hit something with a laser and it makes the grains launch at high velocity and then you can capture them. Um, 
We've also been interested in uh, questions of how does life begin and evolve, where we're looking at that uh, original organic chemical inventory and trying to catalog that by data mining um, the literature, and then also looking at uh, what was the uh, inorganic chemical inventory uh, at the emergence of life, and how do we mimic that on the microscale so that we can get regularly controlled uh, thicknesses and uh, surface areas of different inorganic membranes that might be associated with things like uh, serpentinization-driven uh, hydrothermal systems. Um, and of course, we've got microfluidics at the core of everything. This has actually been uh, where my group has generated an awful lot of publications where we're looking at paper-based microfluidics for terrestrial diagnostics and um, how do we do microfluidics um, uh, faster, better, cheaper. Uh, Giorgio always would claim um, that's Dr. Morbioli now. Um, he would claim that he was a lazy chemist and he wanted to fail faster. Um, and so we've got to the point now where if you want to do uh, microfluidics, thanks to the pandemic, you can do it with a $300 startup costs in your kitchen using a craft cutter and a microwave uh, for less than a dollar a device, um, which is a lot of fun. We're trying to now get that uh, deployed out into different teaching laboratories. Uh, with that, I will have to say thank you to you guys. Uh, I must thank our, our funding agencies. I think I've got most of them on here. The P-Star and Georgia Tech really funded the, the Feldstar project that I was talking about today. Some of the other projects that I hit on quickly were Picasso, STTR, and then we've got a lot of students on fellowship as well. Um, they've been excess excessively uh, successful in, in getting that type of funding. Uh, the people I've, my slides, may have failed on me. I think I've managed to get everyone back on here, except for I didn't list out all of the, the lots of undergrads we've had. I, I think I've had 64 undergrads come through my group at this point um, in the last eight years. So getting all of them put back on here in the last minute was not going to be an option. Um, but with that, thank you guys so much. Thank you for having me talk today. And uh, I guess I'll ask you guys if you have questions. <laughs>